<laughs> Have to win tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was part of me that I was looking at the games, I was like, oh, maybe I should cancel and go to the game tonight. <laughs> Well, welcome. It's so happy to see so many people here tonight for Catholicism 101. Uh, we're going to start with a prayer, and today is the feast day of St. Francis. Uh, so this is a prayer, hopefully from him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart and give me true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, sense and knowledge, Lord that I may carry out your holy and true command. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, again, welcome, and thank you for coming here. So, um, yeah, as you probably heard me say, the idea behind this was that, you know, I've heard from a number of people that um, they hear me talking about something in a homily, and they say, I've never heard that before. Uh, and so this is to try to kind of go back and you know, look at some of the basics of our faith uh, and hopefully help us to grow and to learn even more. So if you don't know a little bit just about me, because, well, anyways. So uh, before I was a priest, if you didn't know, uh, I was in school for a long time. Uh, I have a PhD in history and I was a teacher for a few years before I went to the seminary. So. Uh, I guess teaching is kind of in my blood, and so I can't help it. I like to teach, and that's why my homilies tend to sound like I'm teaching, because that's just who I am, so I'm sorry, but that's who I am. Uh, but I love to teach, and I, I love to do these kind of things uh, to be able to, you know, help spread the faith and help people to grow in their faith, and, uh, and also to be able to interact with you. So. One of the things I always said when I was teaching was, I don't know what you don't know, right? As a teacher and as somebody with an advanced degree, uh, I probably know, well, this, that's going to sound way too prideful. Um, sometimes I speak a little too high, if that makes sense. You know, I might use words or phrases that you don't necessarily understand what I'm saying. So if I say something, or if I use a phrase or whatever, and you don't know what I mean, please feel free to ask me what I mean, to clarify what I mean. Because if you don't know, probably somebody else here doesn't know either. So you're really doing them a favor. So please, feel free to ask questions. I love it, it helps to uh, kind of, uh, it helps with the atmosphere and it helps to be able to learn by asking questions. So what am I saying, again, Please feel free to ask questions. I will stop at various times to ask if there are any questions, but as I'm going, please feel free to ask questions. Um, so the purpose of this class, again, is to help explain the basics of the faith, uh, and then the last class is going to be like one of, one of the big questions that people ask. Um, so hopefully everybody will learn something. So we'll start right off with that first big question that everybody has to ask, which is, is there a God? And how do we know that there is a God? So does God exist? And of course, I'm a priest, I'm gonna say yes. If I said no, then I wouldn't be a priest, right? <laughs> um, so yes, God exists. Now, really where we should do, what we should be doing, or the most important thing is that we get there spiritually, right? We have to have a spiritual encounter with God. We have to have a relationship with God. That's really what's important. But for a lot of people to get there, first, we have to have some kind of logical encounter with God, right? And so really the goal is to go from the head to the heart. But we're starting with the head and then you have to kind of get to him in your heart on your own. So that's kind of the focus. Um, we talk in philosophy 
in theology about what, we're, what are called the transcendentals. These are things that help us to recognize God. And so the three transcendentals, there are more that some other people say, but the three basic ones are truth, beauty, and goodness. So truth, beauty, and goodness can help us get to God. So for instance, with goodness, when we see an act of goodness, we can see God in that act. A great example of that would be like St. Teresa of Calcutta. You know, her work with the poor, you can look at that and you can see God acting. So that's one example of goodness. Uh, beauty. We can see beauty around us. We can see a beautiful landscape. We can see, um, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful things in nature. We can see a beautiful church, and we can come to God through that. This is one example. This is, I think, the most beautiful church that I've ever seen. This is Saint Chapelle in France. Uh, it was built by uh, Saint Louis. The night. Now I'm going into too much detail, so I'm sorry. But this is one of those examples that if you walk into this church, and you walk into it, especially when it's light outside, you come from out of the darkness and you just, the sun is shining through these stained glass windows, and it's just awe-inspiring, and it can lead you to God. So beauty can lead you to God. Nature, you know, I, I took a trip earlier this, this year out west. Uh, seeing the beauty of the Badlands in South Dakota, seeing the magnificence of the Rocky Mountains, uh, the canyon lands and the arches in uh, Utah, all of that can help you lead you to God. Or even just as simple as this morning, I was driving to uh, Sacred Hearts for Mass, and I'm listening to uh, James Horner's music for Apollo 13, which is one of my favorites, uh, and always kind of lifts me up uh, because of, like, the space aspect of it. And then, you know, as I'm driving in the beautiful uh, sun and the clouds and everything, and it was just like this God moment, right? We have these throughout the day, and so beauty can really lead us to God. And then truth, which is what we're going to focus on today, that truth can lead us to God. So we can get to God logically, and many saints have, but again, we have to take that the next step, which is, you know, another talk. Um, so, what we're going to focus on are uh, what are called the five major logical proofs of God, right? Now, the problem with talking logically is that most people today don't think logically. We like to think that we do, but logic isn't taught in school, and so most people don't know how to think logically. So, I'm going to speak in some, like, logical terms, and Hopefully, you can follow along, and if, again, if you don't understand quite what I'm saying, please feel free to ask. Um, these five proofs come from St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, now, you're lucky that I edit this over and over and over again, because originally I was going to go into this long thing about St. Thomas Aquinas and how he taught and all this kind of stuff, but I'm going to do you a favor and, and not talk about that. I'm just going to mention it. Um, but he was a Dominican priest a philosopher, theologian uh, in the 13th century. Uh, many people, or some people, will call him the smartest man in history. Um, but the, his major work is called the Summa Theologica, and that's where these five proofs come from. So basically, what his contention is that we can come to the knowledge of God through reason and experience in the world. And it's based largely on some of the ancient philosophers uh, that, they, that they had reached this conclusion even before the Bible, before Jesus existed. So if they could, certainly we can, with the fullness of truth. And part of what he's doing is recognizing the invisible cause through the visible effects. So God is the invisible God, cause, right? We can't see him but we can understand him and we can get to him through the visible effects, through the things that we can see and, you know, sense. So, for instance, we know this in our own lives, right? 
if we see, if we look out in the horizon and we see smoke, that's the visible effect. We see smoke. The invisible cause is the unseen fire that's causing that, right? So we see the smoke and we intuitively say, oh, there must be a fire over there, right? Even if we can't see the fire. So that's the same kind of reasoning, right? So the visible effect leads to the invisible cause. Does that make sense? Okay. So again, the five proofs. Um, five because if one doesn't get you there, then maybe one of the other ones will, right? So it's kind of like at least one of these should make sense. So the first one is called the argument for motion. And when St. Thomas Aquinas says motion, we should think of that more of what we th would think of as change. So when, when I say motion, it's better for us to think of it as change. Or when he says motion, it's better to think of it as change, okay? Um, so this is talking about cause and effect. So every change has something that causes that change. And, and this is going to be a, a common theme through a number of these uh, proofs. This could lead to a seemingly infinite chain of motion or change, right? So this thing moved, so something caused that to move, but something caused that to move, but something caused that to move, but something caused that to move, right? And that can, can go on seemingly infinitely, right? And infinity is always a logical problem that you have to um, get out of. So there must be something that was not acted upon to start the motion or the change. There's, so there had to be something that started that chain of motion, something that acted by itself, the source of all movement or change. And that is what is called the unmoved mover, which is God. Okay? So all of this change that we see, all of the motion that we see in the world, everything is changing, that all has to be caused by something. And the ultimate first thing that led to all of that change, all that motion, is what we call God. Do I need to clarify anything with that? Okay. So that's the first proof of God, the unmoved mover. The second one is called the argument from efficient or first cause. This is also a cause and effect, but really it's referring to existence itself. Okay, so this cause and effect in existence. So nothing can cause itself to exist. In order to be, be cause, in order to be the cause of itself, it would have to exist prior to its own existence. Right, so like a person can't will themselves to exist. If they did, they would have to have existed before they existed, right? Which is a logical problem. So since that's impossible, everything that exists must be caused by something else. And again, this can't be infinite. There must have been a beginning. And so that beginning or efficient cause, the first cause, is God. So an example of this uh, a tree grows from a seed, and that seed came from a tree, and that tree grew from a seed, and that seed came from a tree, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there had to be like a first cause of all of those trees and seeds, and that's God. Any questions? Yes? By it cannot be infinite? Yeah. Right. So um, these like infinite chains, like that can't go on forever or else nothing would have happened in the first place. Does that make sense? Right. There has to be a start to everything. This was, so I didn't want to get into this, but this was one of the major problems in Greek philosophy that they were trying to figure out was that like when they were trying to figure out like how things started, 
like, um, well, the, eventually you would get to an infinite regress and like that can't happen because then that would mean that nothing happened, right? So there has to be a start for this whole chain to start. I'm probably not explaining that very well, but yeah. Okay, so we have two proofs that are both basically cause and effect, but for different things, right? Motion or change and existence itself. The third proof, you're making it too easy for me. The third proof is the argument from necessary being. Now, this is the one that's going to be, well, at least for me, it's probably the hardest to understand. So I'm going to do my best, and if you get lost, I apologize. <laughs> so the argument from necessary being examines possibility and necessity. Possibility and necessity. So what Aquinas says is that everything in nature has the possibility to be or not to be. That's the question. Shakespeare, right? Everything in nature has the possibility to be or not to be. So, I don't have to exist, and neither do you, right? There's a possibility that none of us exists. So that's what he's examining is the possibility and necessity. Everything that we see has the potential to not exist. Now, following this line, it is impossible for things with a potential for non-existence to have always existed. Therefore, everything that has an end, even if it's just a potential like you or me, must have had a beginning. So, we have the potential to exist or not to exist. And if we have that potential to exist or not to exist, then we didn't always exist. And everything that has a potential must have had a beginning. This can't reach to infinity. So everything that exists had a point in time where it did not exist. Then nothing, wait, all right. If everything that exists had a point in time when it did not exist, then nothing would exist now since there would have been nothing to, be, to, nothing to bring something else into existence. See, this is where I get lost, and therefore you're getting lost. Thus, there may, it must be something that had no potential for non-existence, something that is necessary in and of itself, and this necessary being is God. Yes. So there must be something that has no potential for non-existence, something that is necessary in and of itself, and that necessary being is God. So we all have the potential to not exist. But because we exist, there must be something that is necessary for existence, and that necessary being is God. I hope I summed that up well. Now, as an aside... This is Father Michael, not St. Thomas Aquinas. As an aside, this also proves God's love for us because we don't have to exist, but we do, and we do exist because God loved us into existence. That's an aside that doesn't prove, that's not a proof of God. I'm just saying that our existence is proof that God loves us because we don't have to exist. All right. Clear as mud? <laughs> do I need to clarify this more? Because if I do, we're, gonna, we're not going <laughs> <we're gonna> to skip. <laughs> There's probably a test for me. <laughs> okay. This one, I think, is a little bit easier to understand, so. Um, the argument from gradation or degree. So this was actually, he borrowed this from St. Anselm. Uh, I mean, all of these proofs he borrowed from somebody, essentially, and perfected it, but this one was from St. Anselm, 
uh, who, was, who lived about uh, 100 or so years before him, and we'll see him again in just a moment. But argument from gradation, okay. Everything that exists has qualities. Qualities like goodness, truth, nobility, beauty, etc. Okay, so everything is this has qualities. And these qualities are gradations or degrees, i.e., one thing is more or less good than something else. So, as an example, Shaq is taller than me. That's a, a gradation, right? A, a degree. Right? That's a quality. Tallness would be a quality, and we can, you know, compare ourselves by height, right? That's just an example. Of course, Aquinas is much better than me, so he would, you know, he uses the example of goodness. I use height. These qualities are necessarily compared to a maximum of that quality. So anytime we look at like a quality of something, we're always comparing it to the maximum of what that could be, right? So that's kind of why I use Shaq as an example. He's almost like a maximum of the quality of height compared to me. If you don't know who Shaq is, he was a basketball player and he was very tall, okay? I take it for granted that everybody knows who he is. All right. So every quality has a maximum to which all things possessing that quality must be compared. And there must be something that is maximally good, maximally beautiful, maximally noble, etc., that exists in the highest possible form, and that is what we call God. So whatever, that's why height probably wasn't a good example because God doesn't have height, but goodness, okay, there are people that are better than me, many, right? But the best of all is God, right? So the most good, the most beautiful, the most noble, etc., whatever quality, that is God, okay? So that's the proof of God is that God is the maximum quality of everything that everything else is compared to. Does that make sense? I'm sorry I used a bad example of height, but, you know. Okay. The fifth proof is the argument from design, or also known sometimes as the argument of final cause, or the argument of ends. This is also called today the teleological argument. A nice big word for you. Uh, teleos means the end, the aim, or the goal. And logos, or logical, is, means the reason, explanation, or like similar to where we would say the study of. So like you think about like biology, right? It's the study of the bios, right? Nature, um, or geology, or those things, right? Lo we use ology as the study of. So you can think of this as teleological as the study of the aim or the goal. All right. This is design uh, from natural law. Uh, and it's basically similar to the laws of physics today. Okay, so this is more of like a, today we would think of it more as physics, but um, it's philosophy. All right. So. There are things without intelligence. Uh, Aquinas calls them natural bodies. So this would be basically anything that's not human. So uh, animals, plants, inanimate objects, etc. These are what he calls natural bodies. Uh, and things, so things without intelligence. And these natural bodies, or things without intelligence, act for an end, which means that uh, they are working towards a certain goal. Uh, and they follow the laws of the natural world. And when you observe them, these inanimate objects, these natural bodies, tend to act the same way almost always, unless they are acted upon by a different force because they're trying to achieve the same end. So, an example. If you take a rock and drop it from a certain height, it will always be pulled by gravity in the same way towards the ground, unless 
it is acted upon in a different way, right? So that's an example of inanimate object, a natural body acting towards an end falling to the ground. And it's going to be the same way every time unless it's changed in some way. And what he says is that all natural things follow the laws that are set out for them, not by chance, but by design. So the way that inanimate objects, uh, natural bodies, act, animals, plants, etc., and they're doing the same thing, all of them basically doing the same thing, well, within their category. They do that not by chance, but by design which is kind of a logical thing. Um, and so this necessitates an, an intelligent being that directs these natural bodies. Out of chaos comes order, and order requires intelligence, and that intelligent being is God. So again, essentially what this is saying is that it, when we look at nature, really look at it, we can see that there is order to it, that there has to be a designer to that order. It's not just by chance, uh, and the designer is God. This is the re main reason why, and again, this is a me aside, this is why I never understand uh, mathematicians and scientists, especially scientists, who are atheists, because the more you study science, the more you see that there's no way for chance, for our world, to, for our universe to exist out of chance. There has to be a design behind it. Um, but again, that's an aside. Any question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So instinct would be part of that natural law that has kind of been built into them. So there has to be a designer who, like, kind of placed that there first. Yes? Not humans, because humans have an intelligence that, and a free will that can break that. The previous argument, uh, no, that's speaking to, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good questions. Anything else? Yes. Ah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yep. So how does how does evil fact in, factor into the argument of gradation? So I'm going to give you. One answer and a second answer. The first answer is, come to my last talk, which is all going to be on the problem of evil. So I'm going to give you a, I'm gonna, I'll give a better answer, but essentially the answer is that evil is a lack of something. It's not, it doesn't fit in here because it's not a quality, it is a lack of a quality. See, this is where, I, so I'm going to explain this much better on my final talk about evil, but evil is not a quality, it is a lack of a quality, and therefore it does not, it does not fit into the argument of gradation. Right. Again. Yes. 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 Right. Which, again, I'm not going to get into that right now because that's going to take a whole other talk to answer that question. <laughs> okay. So table that thought for a couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs> it is a very good question, and, and that's why I wanted to answer it in one of these Wednesday nights because it is such a, a big question that people ask. So thank you, but be patient. Any other questions so far about the five 
arguments, because I do have more to, to get to. All right. So those are the five proofs from St. Thomas Aquinas, and of course, there are many, many other people who have written others. I want to mention just a couple others uh, so that you know of them. Uh, I mentioned St. Anselm before. Uh, he was a Benedictine monk about 100 years before St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, and he uh, gave what is called the ontological argument. And this is very much a, so this is going to be much more of like a logical argument, like A, B, C, etc. So. Um, please follow along. So by definition, this is his argument, by definition, God is a being than which none greater can be imagined. So this is kind of the gradation argument, okay? So God is a being of which nothing greater can be imagined. Second point, a being that necessarily exists in reality is greater than a being that does not necessarily exist, okay? So, as an example, I can think of a tree, but a tree that really exists is greater than a tree that's just in my mind, okay? So, a being that necessarily exists in reality is greater than a being that does not necessarily exist. Thus, by definition, if God exists as an idea in the mind, but does not necessarily exist in reality, then we can imagine something that is greater than God. Number four, but we cannot imagine something that is greater than God. Five, thus, if God exists in the mind as an idea, then God necessarily exists in reality. Six, God exists in the mind as an idea. Seven, therefore, God necessarily exists in reality. So, what I really want to focus is on those last three points, okay? So, if God exists in the mind as an idea, if we can have an idea of God, and we do naturally as humans, if God exists in the mind as an idea, then God necessarily exists in reality. God does exist in the mind as an idea, therefore God necessarily exists in reality. That's kind of the summation of, of his points, okay? So, what do I need to clarify here? Yes? Mm -hmm. No. No. So the question is, if God does not exist in somebody's mind, does that mean that he doesn't exist? So this is talking about everybody ever, like in general, right? So this isn't talking about like an individual. So if, if anybody in human history can have an idea of God, which somebody has, then he has to exist in reality, because anything that we can think of in our mind, there's something greater than that that exists in reality. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of bringing in one of the, like, arguments against this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Essentially, yes. So, I mean, basically you would say that this argument only works with God. And it's because of some of the earlier, um, that by definition God is a being than which nothing greater can be imagined. So that's kind of where you have to start off with this, that God is something that nothing can be imagined that's greater than 
and then you kind of work from there. A more modern argument is called the Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, and this is um, most famously uh, by uh, this gentleman, William Lane Craig, um, who still is alive. Um, he's a Christian apologist. He's not a Catholic, but he is Christian. Um, and he is the one who, uh, with other people, came up with this Kalam, cosm Kalam cosmological argument. Well, I'll say that three times fast. Kalam co cosmological argument. Okay. So again, this is going to be um, a logical argument. Okay. So we start with everything that begins to exist has a cause, right? So this is going back to one of the other, one of the proofs of, of Thomas Aquinas. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. So that's where actually this argument started with, um, and it's just what we call in logic a simple syllogism, a logical argument using deductive reasoning. So um, it, within logic, this is the um, all A R B, all C R A, therefore C, all C R A. So um, all A R B, everything that begins to exist has a cause. All C R A, this universe began to exist. Therefore, all CRA, therefore, the universe has a cause, right? So this is just a simple logical argument, okay? Does that make sense? So then he took that further, William Lane Craig took that further, and he said, if the universe has a cause, which we deducted, then an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists who without the universe is beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and enormously powerful. So if the universe has a cause, then it must have been caused by an uncaused personal creator, who, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, because the universe does, a, does have a cause, therefore an uncaused personal creator of the universe exists, who without the universe is beginningless, changeless, spaceless, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is the cosmological argument, right? The universe has a cause, and therefore, there has to be a causer, essentially. Okay? Now, many atheists will look at that and say, well, all you're talking about is the Big Bang, not God. And I'm not talking about that mysteriously popular TV show. I'm talking about the actual Big, Big Bang Theory. Right? So, Yes, the universe has a cause, but that cause is the Big Bang, right? That's what many atheists will say. The problem here is what existed before the Big Bang, right? It couldn't have just come up on its own. What caused the Big Bang? And that's why I and many other people will say it takes a lot more faith to be an atheist who believes in complete chance, random luck, than to believe in an intelligent design. And remember that the Big Bang was first proposed by a Catholic priest. Oh, I forgot to... Oh. See, this is where my lack of French really hurts. Georges Lamar, something like that. A Belgian Catholic priest. Uh, theor theoretical physicist uh, who first uh, proposed what we call the Big Bang Theory. He didn't call it that, but we call it that in 1932. So obviously he believed in God. So the Big Bang Theory isn't really an anti-God theory, right? It's just a scientific uh, explanation of how the universe came to be, but there had to be something that caused it. Right? Any questions? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. 
Right. Right. So you're getting more into the intelligent design uh, theory, right? The the theory, uh, um, you know, that something had to to design this, and it's not just chance, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are there are sci I don't I don't have it off the top of my head, but like the um, chance of a of a planet having life on it is like almost impossible, and especially for it to come out as intelligent life. Um, anyways, yes. So design, right? Any other questions? In the back. What happened to the book of Genesis? No. So, um, so okay, now I didn't expect to get into a scripture uh, discussion. Um, so the book of Genesis, we have to understand that the book of Genesis um, is a, oh, how do I say this? It's not a history book, okay? Um, the Catholic understanding of uh, the book of Genesis is that um, it is a, um, I don't want to say metaphor because that comes out the wrong way. I don't want to say myth because that comes out the wrong way. Um, it helps to explain creation, but it's not necessarily meant to be uh, taken literally. Um, and that's really, so again, that's a larger discussion about Scripture and how we read Scripture, that not all Scripture is meant to be read literally. Uh, it was meant to explain things, um, but not necessarily literally. So like, um, did God literally create everything in seven days? Probably not. Um, is there a literal Adam and Eve, like first humans? I mean, there had to be first humans somewhere. Um, it leads to all kinds of questions um, about uh, what is literal and what isn't. Um, I guess the greater thing is how we read Scripture. Right. Um, yes. So it is, um, you know, it, it was written at, you know, a certain point in time when they're trying to explain how creation came about. Um, but it's essentially what we are supposed to take away from it is the, uh, the moral of the story more than like this is a literal argument of creation, right? So like with Adam and Eve, the point of that story is the fall of humanity, which I will get at in my fifth talk about the problem of evil. <laughs> Um, so it's always like kind of reading what is the moral of the story rather than this is a literal story. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Right. Yes. So that is, again, what I just said is that's the moral of the story. Right. So, yes, original sin is real. That is because that's the point of that story, right? The exact details aren't as necessary as what the story is telling you, right? Because again, see, I didn't mean to get into this whole scripture argument, but we have a, a, a bad understanding of like, well, we have a certain understanding of how things are written, but that's not necessarily how things were written in ancient times, right? Um, how did I get here? <laughs> yes. Okay, so seven time periods instead of seven days, possibly. 
Um, I mean, this gets into the whole like creationist theory, and um, I mean, it's not bad if you're a creationist, but it's also not very good science if you're a creationist. I didn't. Wow. Okay. This is why it's great to have people here asking questions because I did not expect to go here. Yes. Uh huh. Right, how did God, so this is what all of these are saying, is that God didn't come into being, he always has been. So God is uncreated, right? And that's why these arguments like the first cause, the unmoved mover, that's God. God is, always has been, always will be. God is infinite. Okay? So that's the nature of God. The nature of God is that he is uncreated. He is out of, outside of time. Okay. Before I get any further in trouble, um, I do want to talk a little bit about Pascal's wager. So this isn't actually an argument for the existence of God, but I wanted to throw it in there because it's an interesting kind of uh, thing to think about. So, Blaise Pascal, he was a French math mathematician and philosopher in the 17th century, uh, and he proposed what is now called the Pascal's Wager. Okay. So, what he said was that individuals, all of us, engage in a life-defining gamble regarding the belief in the existence of God. Okay. So, what does this mean? God either is or he is not. All right, that's just a statement, right? God either is or he is not. There's no in-between. And every person must make a wager or a choice of whether or not he or she believes that God exists. And there's no getting out of it. There's, you can't, like, punt on that question. You have to make a decision. Either you, either you believe God exists or he doesn't. That's part of, of who we are as people. And what he says is a rational person should live life consistent with, the, with, consistent with the existence of God. So, why? Because if we believe that God exists and we live our life as if God exists and he doesn't, then we've only then we only have small losses by sacrificing certain pleasures and luxuries. Like, it's a very low, like, amount that we're losing if we live our life as if God exists and he doesn't. If we li live our life as if God exists and he does, then we stand to gain immeasurably by eternity in heaven. Okay? Now, on, on the other hand, if we live our life as if God does not exist, and he doesn't, you only gain a small amount of pleasure. And if you live your life as if God does not exist, and he does, then you incur boundless losses by eternity in hell. So basically what he's saying is like a high risk, high reward kind of thing, or low risk, low reward. So, no, that's not what he said. Sorry. What he's saying is that logically, we should live as if God exists, even if he doesn't, because there's more to gain by him existing than by living as if he doesn't, and he does. Does that make sense? I probably just made it worse. So again, he's not, this is not trying to prove that God exists. He's simply trying to convince atheists to live a moral lifestyle, is what he's doing. And what he's hoping is that by getting people to live as if God exists, then eventually they will believe that he does, right? So that's the point of Pascal's Wager. It's not to convince you that God exists, it's just to convince you to live a moral life. And then hopefully you'll get to that, okay? So I just threw this in there um, as like, 
one of those other things that sometimes people will talk about um, and, you know, as a, a kind of a logical argument um, that can get to living a better life. Any questions about Pascal's wager? Okay. Now, where do we go from here? So if we can prove that there is a God, then of course the next question is, how do we know that Christianity is true? So here's the problem. All religions can't be true, right? Because there are contradictions, right? So some religions believe in reincarnation, some religions believe in eternal life. Those both can't be true. One, it's either one or the other, or neither, I guess, but they both can't be true. Um, and so only one religion can be true. Others have partial truth. So how do we know that Christianity is a true one? Well, to begin with, and this is one of those things that people always try to argue against, but their arguments never work. Jesus was a real person. Jesus really existed. And we know that because we have all kinds of proof. There are non-Christian texts that talk about him. If they're non-Christian, why would they talk about him if he, if he didn't exist? All right, there are Roman sources, there are Jewish sources that talk about this, uh, this prophet from uh, Judea named Jesus who, uh, you know, preached and had, a, had people follow him, right? They would have no reason to talk about him if he didn't really exist. So there are non-Christian texts. Um, there are no archaeological findings that have disproved the New Testament. In fact, everything that we have found confirms it. So there's proof from archaeology. And the Bible itself is proof. Now, this is one of those things that uh, people will argue, but the Bible itself is proof of the existence of of Christ. And there's many proofs with that go along with that. So we read about the apostles, right? The apostles themselves are proof that Jesus really existed because here are unintelligent, for the most part fishermen or tax collectors or other people who are low on the, the totem pole on the society who, as we read in Scripture, are scared to death, but somehow they were willing to go to the ends of the earth and die to spread the gospel. Why would they do that if it wasn't true? There's a great… so I don't know if you've ever heard of, the, of Babylon Bee, um, but they are a Christian group that makes like videos and, and it's stuff. Um, mostly, well, they're all satirical. Uh, but they had one that came out uh, around Easter this year that it was great. And it's like the apostles standing around a, a campfire, and they're talking about like how they're going to spread the… and it's like if Jesus didn't really exist, this would, and they're like talking about, okay, so we're going to go out and, you know, we're going to spread this, this, uh, this false uh, teaching, and we're going to die from it. And they're all like, yeah, yeah. Wait, what? And it, like, gets you to think, like, if it was true, if it wasn't true, why would they do that? Why would they risk their life? They knew that they were going to die for this message, and they were willing to die for it. Why would they do that for something that wasn't true? Um, so the apostles are a great uh, proof of the existence of Jesus. The Bible also uses other real historical actors and incidences to prove that he existed. So, for instance, and when it was, it was written during that time. So, if it was written and it wasn't true, the non-believers would have known this and it wouldn't have been trusted. So, a great example of this is the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, where he says, since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, 
just as those who are eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided after investi investigating everything accurately and anew to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. So that's Luke saying, I've done the scientific work, right? I have done the research, and I'm only going to present to you what can be proven. And then what does he say? In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the priestly division of Abijah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So right here, he's using the names of four people, Herod, Zechariah, Abijah, and Elizabeth, all four people that could be proven to live. So he's using the existence of these real people to set it historically and say this really happened. And this happens throughout the Gospels. They are continuously like pointing to other people, other incidences that really happened to prove the rest of what happened. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it's Zachariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist. Yep. Okay. So this is, you know, it's right there. The proof, they, they intentionally wrote the Gospels to give historical proof to the existence of Jesus. There's also a proof from what Christ in the Bible is not. So this is the proof from from not existence, I guess. Um, so if you made up a Messiah, and I'm talking about in the first century, if they made up a Messiah, they would have made him up to be powerful, not one that was humiliated, tortured, and killed. That kind of defeats the purpose of creating a Messiah. It's similar to how, and this is going to be my second um, reference to it tonight, it's similar to how Apollo 13 is proof that we really went to the moon, right? If you know Apollo 13 as the mission that failed, it's a successful failure, there would, be, there would be no reason for them to make up a failure, right? If, if, they were, if they were making up the whole thing, they wouldn't make up a failure. They would only make up successes. So that's kind of the same similar argument. All right, so these are kind of the historical and literary proofs that Jesus really existed, okay? So there's never been a good argument that Jesus did not exist as a human, okay? So granting that Jesus existed as a human, how do we know that he was really God? So some try to say that Jesus was just really a good teacher, right? Um, now, the most famous example of this would be Muslims who say that, well, he was a good uh, teacher, but he wasn't God, right? And even some Christians will try to say that. But this argument is absurd based on his own words that we hear in Scripture. We hear, so Jesus never literally says, I, well, it's kind of, it's inferred by what he says. Okay. John 10, 30. Jesus says, the Father and I are one. There's no other way of reading that other than he's saying he is God. Mark uh, 14, uh, verses 60 through 64. This is also in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, this is during the... <clears throat> um, trial of Jesus, the high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said to him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? 
they all condemned him as deserving to die. So this is where we really have to understand Scripture to understand what's going on here. Uh, We have to understand the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. So what's happening here? He's being questioned. Are you really saying that you are the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? In other words, are you really saying that you are the Son of God? And what does Jesus answer? He says, I am. And what is that? That's God's name. He's answering, yes, I am. And then he says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then what is, how does the high priest react to that? He doesn't say, oh, you're crazy. He says, what further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is blasphemy? He's claiming to be God. That's why he's blasphemy. And then they tear their garments, which is a uh, reaction that they would have to hearing blasphemy. So the high priest and all of those gathered there knew that he's saying he is God. He's not saying anything else, right? In John uh, chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, before Abraham came to be, I am. Again, he's using the name of God to say, I always existed. Therefore, he is God, right? So anybody that claims that Jesus wasn't saying that he's God doesn't know Scripture, right? He clearly says it multiple times. Well, clearly if you know how to read it. Okay, so if Jesus really existed, was he really God? He certainly claimed he was. And that leads to, uh, I love this. You've probably heard me reference him multiple times in my homilies. C.S. Lewis, um, not a Catholic, but he basically was. Um, Probably the greatest, certainly one of the greatest theological, philosophical minds of the 20th century. Um, Specifically here, he proposed what is called the trilemma. Um, Trilemma meaning three, right, tri that there are only three possibilities. And this is responding to the claim of some people that Jesus was just a great teacher. I sure hope that I brought my, uh (laughs) uh-oh. I didn't bring all my pages, awesome, all right. So, the trilemma. Again, some people say that that, uh, Jesus was just a good teacher and not God. So what C.S. Lewis says is that there are only three possibilities with Jesus. Either he is telling the truth and he is God, or he is insane, or he is the Antichrist. He is devil him, the devil himself. Those are the only three possibilities, C.S. Lewis says, to this problem of whether or not Jesus is God, because he claims to be God. So either, either he's telling the truth, or he's lying and he is the Antichrist, or he's crazy, like, uh, you know, people who claim to be, you know, the, um, that might be a bad example. People who claim to be somebody that they're not. I'm not going to use examples because I could get in trouble there. Um, Does that make sense? So basically what he's saying is, C.S. Lewis is saying, Jesus has put it on us. We have to decide what we believe. Do we believe him? Do we think that he's a liar? Or do we think that he was crazy? That's the only possibilities. Some people refute that and say that there are other possibilities, but I I go along with C.S. Lewis. Any questions? Um, I'm not going to get into this too much, but I was going to go into a little bit about the proof of Catholicism, right? So if we have proved that God exists and we have proved that Jesus was God and that Christianity 
is the true religion, then how do we prove that Catholicism is the true uh, faith within Christianity? That's basically what we're going to be getting at to a certain extent with the rest of these talks, but very briefly, um, church history is one proof. Um, this is something that my church history professor said, um, and he's not the only one. Many others have said this. Uh, the more you, you study church history, the more you come to realize that this must be the true church, because there's no way that the church would have survived everything that it did, all of the bad things that have happened, if it weren't the true church. Like, it would have, it would have collapsed on its own, like, on the problems that have arisen throughout history if it wasn't set up by Jesus himself in the true church. Okay, now that takes some explanation, which I won't get into here, but that's one of the things. Uh, the other proof um, that I would just posit very briefly uh, is the Eucharistic miracles, right? Uh, Catholicism is the true faith because we are the only faith that has the true Eucharist, and Eucharistic miracles prove that Jesus truly is present uh, in the Eucharist. Um, I don't have time to get into that, but if you're interested, there's some great stuff out there about Eucharistic miracles, and I highly recommend looking into it. Um, blessed Carlo Acuti is probably the first person to start with. He's, um, you know, if you don't know him, he was a teenager uh, who died, um, what, 1990s, I believe? Not that long ago. Um, but he started... Uh, a website that catalogs every Eucharistic miracle in history. Um, so that's a good place to start. I'm not going to get more into that um, before we get into that. Any questions that you'd like me to clarify for right now? Yes. The, what do you mean? Oh, um, so he, well, I didn't go into that too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, to a certain extent, he's basically saying you have, to, you have to make that decision yourself based on all the other evidence that's out there. Um, So I'm kind of punting your question. Okay. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So if you didn't hear that, uh, a very brief uh, answer to those. So if he was insane, then the apostles wouldn't have followed him. Other people wouldn't have followed him. Um, if he was the devil, then he wouldn't have humiliated himself enough to die, um, which is actually a really interesting thing. Um, if you ever read, like, um, exorcists or people who are, like, um, experts in um, uh, uh, visions of, of Christ, they will tell you that the number one thing to recognize whether or not it's a true um, uh, vision of Christ is whether or not he has the nail marks. Because Jesus himself always presents himself with his nail marks as a sign of his humility and of who, of who he really was. But the devil, if he tries to present himself as Christ, never has the nail marks because he doesn't have the humility to do that. So, that kind of, that goes along with what you're saying. Which again, we'll get into the last talk when I talk about the proof of evil and the fall of Satan. We got done quicker than I thought, so that's a good thing. Any other questions for tonight?
All right. So um, I hope you will join me uh, for further talks. So next week, uh, we'll be talking about the seven signs from heaven. We'll be talking about the sacraments, uh, what they are and what they mean uh, to us. So again, I hope to see you next week. Thank you again for coming. Let's end in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here together tonight. We thank you for uh, helping us to uh, come to the knowledge of you, your existence, of who you are, and your love for us. We ask you to be with us always. We ask you to help us to share this good news with people, everyone that we encounter. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you do have any other questions, you can always ask me before you leave. If you're, you know, too tentative to ask before other people, that's fine. Um, I'll be around to answer more questions.